So last week we talked about what it means to be a growing faith family. And the theme of the day was that as a farmer, um, you've got to put in the work, but then you don't control the growth. You put in the work and then you allow God by the course of nature to do the growth. And as a faith family, we have to put in the work to prepare for growth. We have to do the things that God um, has called us to do. And then when we do them and prepare, then God will be in control of the growth. We can't. We can manufacture growth, but it won't be healthy growth. It'll be growth that quickly dies out. And to grow in a healthy, sustaining way, we have to prepare and then allow God to take control. Well, our, our, our mission, our vision, is that First Baptist Mason exists to be a growing faith family rooted in Christ, planted in a field of overwhelmed lives. And we recognize that there's so many... We recognize that so many lives in our community, so many of our lives within our church are overwhelmed, and so we need to find solutions. And that's where the growing faith family part comes in as we prepare to do the work that God wants us to do to help these overwhelmed lives. But we can't do any of that if we are not rooted in Christ. If we have not placed firm, solid roots in a foundation of Jesus Christ. And if you think about roots of a tree, some of us don't like roots, right? Because they grow through our pipes or they get in the way and they mess with our foundation and everything. But a strong, healthy tree, the roots of this reaching nourishment continue to grow and they continue to go deeper and they allow that that tree as older as, as the as as the tree ages and gets older and older and older then the roots get deeper and deeper and the tree becomes stronger and stronger and that's what we want to become as a church as we age as a church we are 152 years old and we want to see 175 and 200 and 225 and and, and however long we can before Jesus comes back, we want to see a church that's not only uh, growing, but we want to see a church that's thriving and a church that is healthy. And the only way we can do that is to put our roots in Jesus Christ. Because when you are rooted in Christ, you are developing a strong foundation that is developing strength and resilience. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, Therefore, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And when you read this passage of Scripture, these two verses, you begin to look at it and recognize that as Paul is writing this portion of the letter to the church at Colossae, he is writing about spiritual maturity. He's writing about believers that are moving past the milk that infants drink and onto the solid food of faith. And their faith is maturing and growing. And that's what a growing faith family is, is a one that is not only growing numerically, but it is growing in their faith and in their spiritual maturity. And we looked at that last week at what that means to do that. But I want to stop for a second and give you some, some benchmarks, some things that in your own personal life, that you can look at and kind of take a, 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 a self-assessment, a, check, a checkpoint of how am I doing in my spiritual maturity? How am I doing in my growth of spiritual maturity? How do I stack up in these areas? And they come from a, a, an author named Dallas Willard um, who wrote uh, a book uh, uh, called Reno, uh, Renovation of the uh, Spiritual Mind. And it says this, the first step The first marker that we need to look at is that mature Christians don't defend themselves when found to be wrong. So if we're a growing faith family who's growing in maturity, when someone finds something that we have done, an offense that we have done, or or something that is out of character, a mature Christian doesn't defend themselves. In fact, they are thankful to be found out because it fulfills the Proverbs in Proverbs 9, 8 that says... Correct the wise and they will love you. Correct the wise and they will love you. This is different than our world. 
Because what happens in our world when someone is accused of doing wrong? to defend themselves. They want to explain why they did it. They want to rationalize their behavior. They want to come up with an excuse. But Christ-like people don't defend themselves um, they are, when they are wrong, but they also don't defend themselves against false accusations. They say what's needed to establish the facts so that justice can be done, but they're not obsessed with defending their reputation. If they're wrong, they, if they're wronged, they accept it and they trust final justice to God. And Willard says that if they follow this model, they're following the model of Jesus who made himself of no reputation. A growing, spiritually mature believer gives up their reputation when they decide to follow Jesus. They become known as a follower of Christ, not as a follower of themselves. So where do you stand in that? When, when you have found guilty of doing something that is not of upstanding character, how do you respond? Do you respond with humility or do you respond with aggression and defense? The second thing that he says is mature mature Christians don't feel they are missing something by not sinning. They don't feel like when they By not sinning, they don't feel like they're missing out. And I said a week or so ago that one of the things that keeps us from doing the things that God wants us to do is that we are too in love with our sin. And we are too in love to get rid of the sin in our life. A maturing Christian, a mature Christian, does not love sin. In fact, they are no longer subject to temptation. They doesn't mean that they're no longer subject to temptation, but it means that they aren't attracted to the temporary and soul-destroying pleasures of sin. They're not perfect, but they hate when they sin. They're not attracted to it. They're running from it. They don't feel deprived as if God is withholding something good from them. They develop a taste for other pleasures and find happiness in holiness. And a key marker in saying, am I part of a growing faith family? because I'm growing in my faith and maturity, is this shift in leaving behind sinful behaviors. Doesn't mean you're ever going to get rid of them, but those sinful behaviors that have enslaved you no longer hold the same appeal that they did in the past. Because you're growing in Christ. Your roots are getting deeper in Christ. And the third marker that he talks about is that mature Christians find it easier and more natural to do God's will than not to do it, which is what I think is important when we talk about a growing faith family, that as you grow closer, it's easier to say, God is calling us to do it, let's do it. Not God is, God is calling us and that's a real stretch, that's scary, we're we're afraid to go this route. Mature Christians find it easier and more natural to do God's will than not to do it. They take seriously what Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle of heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. And I think all of us deep down inside desire to find rest for our souls. In our Life Connection group this morning, we were talking about the the idea of Sabbath. And I'm going to be honest, it was a very uncomfortable idea for us to be able to say, we're going to take a whole day and devote it to God and rest in Him. And Jesus is calling us here in Matthew chapter 11, saying, my yoke is easier to bear and the burden I give you is light. You will find rest for your souls in me. And so when God calls us to do something, if we are walking in his will and doing his will, that yoke is lighter than if we're trying to do something on our own. And we will be able to find rest in him because we are in his will. Being formed, Dallas Willard says, being formed to the full measure of the statue of Christ means that we want to do his will 
because our will is being shaped into his will. We do not find it as difficult to obey. In fact, in some areas, obeying is easier and more joyous than doing anything else. And if you found this in your life, as you move closer, as your roots get deeper in Christ, as you have grown as a, as a Christian, have you found doing Christian things, Christian things a little bit easier to do? One of the great ones that I love, and, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's funny because, um, because I was there once in my life, and I know a lot of people struggle with this, is praying out loud. For some of you, I just said that, and you're like, do not ever ask me to do that. Because it's a very scary thing. But the more you grow in your faith, the more you become mature in your faith, the less and less scary that becomes. And when it's like, okay, would someone like to pray? It's like, I'll do it. And then you're like, where did that come from? But it's, it's God moving in your life and moving you closer. So if we've got these spiritual markers of maturity to help us know where our faith is, and if we're growing ourselves as part of a growing faith family, how do we know if we're rooted in Christ or if we're rooted in something else? What do we do to put in our lives that allow us to make those foundations firm? What do we do by, how do we root ourselves in Christ so that we put our life's foundations in him? Because Jesus talks in Luke chapter 6, verse 47. And you've heard this parable before, but he says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. So a man that listens to what Jesus is saying and does the things that he tells him to do is like this man. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. That's what a man that listens to Jesus and does the things that Jesus wants you to do does. He's like a house built on a solid foundation that the river, when it, when it floods, it cannot shake that foundation. But Jesus gives a warning in the very next verse, in verse 49, and he says, but the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the, rule, the, the, the ruin of that house was great. You can put your, your, your life in a solid foundation, you can root it in Christ or you can root it in something that passes away. Something that is like shifting sand. And far too often in Western Christianity, we've put our, our foundation in a pastor or in a leader or in a church or in a movement. In a president. And then we only see those things falter and fade away. And we don't have a foundation anymore. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says to build your house on the sand. But when we root ourselves in the fertile ground of Jesus, guess what happens? We dig our roots deep in him. We can withstand any test that comes our way. How many of you can stand strong in the testing of your life because you've dug your roots deep in Christ? Or how many of you, when someone, when the, when the foundation has been shaken, your life has been shaken? Your life has fallen and crumbled around you because you are putting all of your your roots into something that didn't exist. A prime example of this was a financial disaster. The Great Depression, 1929, how many people had put their foundation in the economy and in the stock market? And when it crashed and every, they lost everything, they had nothing. But there were faithful people that, that, that 
that thrived and prevailed in that. Even though times were tough, they had their roots in Christ and in faith. And out of that, we saw a faith movement. How can we deepen our roots so that we can withstand the trials and tests of life? How do we deepen our roots? How do we make sure that as part of a growing faith family, we are rooted in Christ? Well, first, we need to be rooted in the word of God. Go back to that passage in Colossians chapter 2. I've already, <coughs> I've already read verses 6 and 7, but let's expand that passage a little bit and read verses 4 through 8. And it says this, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, therefore, in verse 6, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. And Paul's writing about the things that you need to do to be, to make sure you are spiritually mature and that you're rooted in him. And he gives us some pictures here. He uses imagery to, to illustrate what our life should be like when it comes to growing in Christ. And the first image that he uses, we find in verse five, and he's using a military image, the army. When he talks about it in verse five, he says, he says, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Order and firmness. It's a military term, a military analogy saying rank and file that's your order you know your appropriate place in life you know that christ is the head of you and you are the body and because of that when he says your order and then he says your firmness because you know your place and you're in the proper rank and file now you can stand firm and put forth a solid front to the enemy Oftentimes, it's not who has the most firepower in war. It's who can show unified, a unified front. Are we as Christians understanding our proper order and then being able to put in a firmness of our faith to show the enemy a unified front? The second picture that he gives is one of um, after talking about discipline and obedience, because our lives as maturing Christians need to be full of discipline and obedience, is that we must be that of the pilgrim. We must learn to walk and walk in Christ. Verse 6, he says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. You started with Christ. That's how you became a believer, right? You put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's the only way you can be become a believer. Is that if you believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Paul says in Romans 10 that you will be saved. That's the only way. And so you started with Christ, now you must continue to walk with Christ. Meaning you started with faith because you have nothing else but faith when it comes to your belief in Jesus Christ. You started with faith, you need to continue in your faith. So a growing Christian... A spiritually mature Christian who's rooted in Christ understands that I started with him, I'm going to continue with him, and I'm forever going to be with him. And I started with faith in him, and I'm going to continue with my faith in him, and I'm forever going to have faith in him because he says he is who he is. The third picture is a tree. And this is where we get the rooted in Christ, is to be rooted. Verse 7 Rooted and built up in him. There's actually two pictures right there. The tree and the a building. The tree means that we can stand up against the, root, the winds of weak doctrine. 
We can stand up against the winds of false spiritual movements. We can stand up against false teaching because that was a big, big thing of the day, just as it's a big, big thing of, to, of our day today. When we are rooted in our faith in Christ, in that healthy soil, and you'll notice part of what we loved about this, this image here is that there is, uh, the water is, 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 is a picture of health and, and nourishment and nutrient. And we see the fruit that comes from it. But on the other side, where there's no nu- nourishment coming, it's dead. And we love that it showed that. And it gave us this picture of, of, of that, that health and that growth. But when you are rooted in Christ, in the fertile soil of Jesus Christ, you don't ever need to change out the soil. And you don't even ever need to go anywhere else to find nutrients. Because everything you have is in Him. And Him alone. I said Paul used the imagery of the the tree, but he also used the imagery of a building to be built solidly, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. You ever been in a really well-built building? You know, this is a pretty, pretty solid building. I mean, anytime you walk into a room that's nothing but cinder blocks, that's a pretty solid built building, Right? But if you really want to know how well a building's built, let it go through a natural disaster, like a tornado or an earthquake. And I remember in 2013, we lived in Norman, Oklahoma, and early in the month of May, there was a F, F5 tornado. If you don't know what that is, it's one of the strongest tornadoes on earth that went through the town north of us, Moore, Oklahoma. And it affected a lot of people in our church. We were a, a multi um, uh, community congregation and it affected a lot of people in our church and so um, the next day uh, several of us staff members at the church we went out to do what we could to help now, i'll never forget standing at ground zero of where the tornado was the strongest it could be that the the national weather service said this was the point that it became an f5 i remember standing there and looking around and what was a neighborhood you could now see miles around because everything was flattened and 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 in fact, most of the foundations were ripped up from the ground. But the crazy thing was, was there were certain homes that you could tell were built better than the others. Why? Because in one of the strongest storms ever known to man, part of it was still standing. It was damaged for sure, but part of it was still standing, and it was standing firm. And there was one particular house. And the house that I was, that I was helping out was a, a friend of mine's family member. And we were trying to salvage some of his stuff. And about three houses to the west, all that stood was a closet. That closet was a reinforced storm shelter. And in that reinforced storm shelter, two members of that family got in that room and survived. People all around that area lost their lives because they did not have something that could withstand the storm. And those two family members were able to survive the, the greatest storm their life would ever bring to them because they were in something that was built solid and built to withstand. When you root your life in Christ, you are being built solid, ready to withstand the greatest trials you could ever face. He talks about the tree, he talks about the building, and then he he, he talks about the school. A, A spiritually mature Christian is not just rooted in Christ and being built up with a firm foundation, with an established foundation, something that's going to last, but it's one that he uses the picture of a school. And you're like, he doesn't say school in that. Well, look at what he says. Just as you were taught. He talks about the importance of education. The importance of continually learning. Being lifelong learners. Being taught. That means being discipled. And in the context of our church today, that means moving beyond a Sunday morning worship service and being part of our discipleship strategy here at the church. And one of the things we're working on 
um, behind the scenes is how can we be better at discipling people in our church? And we're, 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 we're trying to, to think through what it means, but here's the, main, here, here's the biggest thing I've come up with. It's not earth shattering. It's, 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 it's not anything innovative or creative. The way to further our discipleship ministry here at the church is for the people of our church to want to be disciples. To understand that they need to be taught the Word of God. They need to be taught doctrine. They need to be taught Scripture. They need to be taught who God is and how God can change their life. And then they need to turn around and do that to someone else. They need to be disciples who make disciples. Each and every one of us needs to take ownership in that. If we want to root ourselves in Christ, this is the byproduct of it. To learn, to continually learn, and then to teach. Then the last picture he gives is one of the river um, when he says abounding. In verse 7, he says that they are abounding in thanksgiving. Anytime Paul uses the word abounding, he is talking about a river overflowing its banks. It's abundant. It's living water that is never ending. It is flowing, overflowing its banks, giving us the nutrients that we need, Get, quenching the thirst that we so desire to quench. It's talked about in Psalm Chapter 1, verse 1 through 4 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight in the law of the Lord and on his law, he meditates day and night. He's learning because he's meditating on God's word day and night. That person, that man that does that, that man that lives out what Paul is saying here in Colossians 2 is also talked about here in Psalm 1. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Read that again. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. When the river flows abundantly in your life, because you're growing in Christ and you're rooted in Him, you will prosper. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be financially wealthy. doesn't mean all your problems are going to go away. doesn't mean you're automatically going to find the health that you desire. What it means when it says he will prosper means that on that day that you meet Jesus, he looks at you and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the fruit that comes from being rooted in Christ. We've got to root, root ourselves in the word of God. We've got to root ourselves in the love of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3, verse 16 says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you, you to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. When you are rooted and grounded in Christ's love, you have the strength to begin to comprehend with all saints, begin to understand with all the saints the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We can't understand God's love for us. But we can rest in it. 
We can ground ourselves in his love and be filled with the fullness of God because he loves us. When we root ourselves in his love, we begin to fully understand how deep and how wide and how everlasting and how unconditional his love for us is. The closer you grow to him, the more you understand his love for you. The cliche, absence makes the heart grow fonder, does not work in your relationship with Christ. You've got to be with him to understand how much he loves you. You've got to put your roots in him to understand the sacrifice that God made for you. And then you've got to be rooted in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20 of Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. The power at work within us is the Holy Spirit. When you become a Christian, just like uh, uh, when when the early believers in Acts 2 received the Holy Spirit upon them, The Holy Spirit is inside of you. We can't do any of this without the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't accomplish the vision that God is giving us that we will continue to to bring out to you over the next five years because it doesn't happen quickly. It's a process. You don't get saved and become a spiritually mature Christian. It's a process. A process allowing the Holy Spirit to work inside of you, the Holy Spirit to guide you, to the Holy Spirit to lead you. And just as the early church were told to wait until the Holy Spirit came upon them, and when he, the Holy Spirit did, they saw unbelievable signs and wonders through the power of the Holy Spirit. We as believers, we place our faith in Jesus Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, to accomplish the works that God has placed before us. We cannot do God's work without the Holy Spirit, nor can we receive our marching orders without the Holy Spirit. We can get some orders, but they might not be God's will. And we have to have the Holy Spirit to help us discern when God places something on our hearts. Or when something comes upon our hearts, is it God placing it there or is it something else. The Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit allows us to to discern, is this God or is this something leading us astray? Is this the enemy deceiving us? Because Satan comes to uh, steal, kill, and destroy. And he is deceitful and he deceived Adam and Eve and he has deceived ever since the fall of man. And he'll continue to deceive. But the Holy Spirit, when we root ourselves in Christ, and we allow the Holy Spirit to take over our life, the deception becomes a lot easier to see because of the gift of discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit. But let's be real. We can talk all this about being rooted in Christ, but you can't be rooted in Christ if you don't have Jesus Christ. If you've not given your life to Jesus Christ, you can't be rooted in him. Go back to Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, you cannot root yourself in Christ if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. You cannot be established in the faith if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ. You can't be abounding in thanksgiving for what God has done in your life if you, God hasn't done anything in your life. You've got to give your life to Jesus. You have to have a relationship with him. You have to make him Lord of your life. You have to Give your all to him, to take up your cross, deny yourself and follow him. And you have to say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Believe in your heart that he died on the cross for your sins. 
and you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And with that, you will be saved. And some of you in this room have done that, and you're, you're like, I need to focus on the roots of my, my life and making sure I'm putting my roots in Jesus Christ. Some of you in this room have never even accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And God's calling you to do that today. God puts a tug on your heart. You've got to answer that call. Because that's him saying, come home to me. Make me Lord and Savior of your life. The band's going to come and sing a song. We're going to close with that. And I just pray that if, if God is doing something in your life, that you would be willing to step out. You would be bold and courageous enough to step out and come down and say, I don't know what's happening, but I need to know what's happening. Or you might know for sure that right now God's saying, I want you coming home and I'm ready. And you're like, here I am, Lord, here I am. You make me, make, I want to make you the Lord of my life. And you want to tell the whole church about that so we can celebrate that with you. That would be awesome. You might say, you know what? We're not f- through with this series yet, but I, I, I hear this growing faith family thing and I need to, to find out what it takes to become a part of that. I'm going to be down here at front. The band's going to sing a, sing a song over you. I just pray that you ask God, check those markers. How am I doing in my spiritual maturity? And what does it mean for me to make sure you, I am rooted in you and you've got a hold of the roots, filling them with nourishment in my life?